Hello and welcome. We are very happy to present you today Michael Schwern. And yeah, he will give a talk likely about Test Builder, but I'm not sure, but yes, it will be certainly an interesting talk. So yes, I hand over the microphone to Michael Schwern. Please, Yay. Michael. Thank you, Max. Hello. So, can everybody hear me? Can you hear me? Great. Mic's not on. Sure claims it's on. Hello. It thinks it's getting something. Oh. Oh. Okay. I'll just have to just have to project. Um, so uh, yeah, I uh, I uh, got an opportunity to come here a little late. So uh, they, they just sort of, you know, it was after the, was after the, the call for proposals was done, so uh, they just sort of gave me a slot that, and of course, you may have noticed it, I'm talking about um, stage two of my profitability plan. Um, no, uh, what I'm actually talking about is, uh, is Test Builder 2. Excuse mm -hmm. me, I just need the, uh, the transmitter. Oh. Keep talking, it's not, not talking. Sure. Um, now, Test Builder 2 has been in the works for five years now, uh, a while, uh, and um, so I didn't, I didn't want to, I wanted to come here and, you know, say something new and interesting and not just give you guys a recycled talk or something you could see on the internet, um, and a lot has changed, so um, I figured that uh, I would upgrade my talk from cats to uh, ponies, and um, and a whole lot has changed since uh, since Test Builder 2 started. Even like rewriting this talk, most of the code was was didn't make any sense. So um, let's talk about in the beginning. Uh, I'm going to give a little bit of background about about why why do we have even have a test builder. So in the beginning, there was Perl one in uh, 1987. Can we get some of the lights off to see the? Then it's completely dark. That's okay. I don't. You got, will you be scared? What's that? Yeah, do it. Yay! All, all your glowing faces. <laughs> so in the beginning, there was Perl 1 in 1987. And, uh, and it, it established all the, the major, what? Oh, the camera can't see. I see, OK. Um, I can get a flashlight and like. <laughs> so it established all the major uh, testing conventions that we already have used in use today, uh, 25 years ago or whatever. Uh, you had a .t directory that's full of test files, and even though they didn't have the .t convention, each of those is an individual test program. Um, they were normal pro programs, and, uh, and they output TAP. Um, but we, they didn't call it TAP, but, but there it was. And that's all the major elements of what's going, of what's going on. Uh, you have a, um, uh, a test program. In that case, you know, op.repeat. And it spits out um, some tap. And then that tap gets input to a program that interprets it for you and you know, tells you how things went. And uh, you know, it has its advantage in that um, uh, since, a different, since all this process has to do is spit out the test format, doesn't have to do any of the interpretation, this can be as simple or as complicated as it wants to be. It doesn't need to pull in any kind of libraries or anything else. We can just print and everything else. Uh, so now, fast forward into today, it's basically the same thing, except uh, this is probably using test more. It's still outputting tap. Instead of the old test, dot, uh, test program, we have test harness, and it, that spits out all tests successful. Now, the important thing to take away from this, if you don't have, are not familiar with how the testing system works, is that there's this, this clear divide between the two halves of how a test is run. This side is the domain of test builder. It's the test program that outputs tap. And this side is the domain of test harness. It's, it, it gets tap uh, as an input, and it shows you it in a human readable form. We're talking about only this side. Very important thing to realize. I can't do anything on this side. Uh, Ovid can, um, but I can't. Yeah, get him. Um, that's the really important part here to understand is that there's a complete separation between these two. 
Right, so moving on, um, brings to Test Builder. What is Test Builder? It's a module to write other testing modules. But before we talk about what it is, you kind of have to talk about why it is. So like why, if TAP is so simple, why do we need all this extra complexity? Um, and uh, so for about the first 10 years of Perl development, tests were just programs that printed TAP. And obviously, you know, pr literally print OK, else print not OK. Um, and it's really tedious, and, and it, strangely enough, it wasn't really so obvious that, it was, that there were better ways to do it. We had a big fight when we uh, uh, first introduced the new stuff. And um, so you can write a test library to encapsulate all that, and there was test.pm uh, in like 5005, and it printed and it handled the test counter and, and everything. It was a good start, but it was very limited in what it could do. And then there's test more that's uh, a little bit better. Um, and uh, that came in like 2001, and I beat people with sticks until they started to use it and write, 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 write tests. Um, and that has all the basic, 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 basic things that you want to do uh, to write tests. It's documented, it's unambiguous, um, and it prints out you know, failure diagnostics and you know, it'll actually happen. It's pretty good. But of course, people want more. Um, uh, they, they don't want just the generic stuff. They want like, well, what if I'm testing a web page? What if I'm testing HTML? What if I'm testing XML? What if I'm testing a database? And they all wanted this in test more. Um, why? Well, the reason is this. Let's say you wrote your own module. By the way, if I'm talking really fast and you can't keep up, please let me know. Um, uh, so if you wrote your own test module, and back in the day, you would have to like have a test counter, and you, uh, if you're outputting your own tap and everything, you would print you know, not if it failed, and then OK in your own counter. Well, of course, if you try to use this with test more together in the same process, um, they'd be fighting, and you'd get that, and that's no good. Uh, so that's the, the basic rationale for a test builder. But of course, people were like, well, I'll, I'll just write a wrapper around test more is OK, and then I'll be using that. And that, that works, that gets the counter right. But then when you get your failure diagnostics, uh, test more is OK, looks, up the, looks at its caller and says, oh, my, my test failed inside some test module that you don't actually care about. Uh, so you don't know where, that, where to look in the test file for that thing to fail. Um, and the final reason to have a test builder is that people wanted really detailed control over how tests run and information about the state of the test and stuff that just would clutter up the interface horribly. Uh, so that all needed to go somewhere else, and that somewhere else is Test Builder. Um, test Builder came into being. Test More was re rewritten to use it. And now if you wanted to write your own module, you can you use Test Builder. Um, you grab the Test Builder singleton object, and you call its OK method. And it all works out together. And test more does the same, and test simple, and test exception, and test everything. All is working on the same ground. It gives you the right location of the test failure. The counter is shared. Everything is wonderful. You can configure details of, of you know, where test output goes and how the tap format is formatted. Um, and we wound up having this nice ecosystem of more test modules uh, that appeared. I mean, lots and lots and lots and lots of test modules. Um, Probably three, four, five, six, I don't know, probably like 3,000 of them. Well, that can't be right. Eh, maybe it is. Um, so the, the, the point I want to make is that um, once upon a time, there was only test more. And that meant that uh, I te uh, test more had an undue influence on how to write tests, and I controlled test more which means I had an undue influence on how everybody in the Perl community writes tests. And if I have a bias, or I'm overlooking something, or prejudice, or whatever, then you all get that bias, and you get that blind spot, and you get that, 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 that prejudice or short-sightedness. Add in Test Builder, and now there's lots of different test modules, and they all work together. If I don't want to put something in Test More, go write your own. That's great. Um, and now uh, the influence on the testing community is, is you know, lots and lots and lots of different people. And that's great. Uh, that means that I can't hold all the rest of you back. That's really, really important. So then comes Test Builder. Um, and all the, all the responsibility uh, has been pushed down from Test More to Test Builder. There's still only one Test Builder. And I still control that uh, portion of how, you got, how, how people can write tests. And that has my biases and my design flaws and, and everything else. So that's after um, 
uh, after you know, 11 years of testing, we've learned a whole lot about how to do it. And you know, worse, Test Builder reflects my design flaws from 10 years ago. Uh, so it would be nice to have, similar to for test more, to expanding out into whole, uh, lots and lots of different test modules, if Test Builder allowed lots and lots of different builders. And we'll see how to do that. Um, so Test Builder, it's 11 years old. Well, let me pause for a moment. Are there any questions before I move on? Right. Uh, test Builder is 11 years old. It was written at a time when we really didn't know much about testing. Um, and it survived pretty well, but it's got its design problems. And there's some things it just will not let you do. Uh, one of the big design problems is people really want to be able to, to halt the test when a test fails. And for architectural reasons, I'm going to kind of gloss over. Um, it just, Test Builder will not support this. Um, although, Test Most will, because Curtis is willing to do the, the design hacks that I'm not, which is great. Um, uh, uh, some people really want it. I am not a fan of it, but it's, like I said, it's part of my job to make it possible and then get the hell out of the way. So this is a major design goal of, um, of Test Builder 2 that still hasn't been realized. But things like it have been. Um, I'm going to gloss over why this is this won't work. Um, the other issue is parsable diagnostics. Um, so right now we have something, you know, the output looks like this when something fails, and there's this comments that has all the juicy metadata that you really want. You know, uh, well, the file number, the file and line number, and you know, what actually failed, and everything else. And um, people have, in the past, tried to parse this, and then I go and change the format slightly and their stuff breaks and you know we had test HTML matrix that could produce like a great web page of all your tests and dig into them and it was fantastic but it would just it was so uh, flaky because of this and we really really wanted this since um, since the Oslo QA hackathon where uh, it can output um, YAML or JSON or whatever and it's all structured and uh, some, something you can parse it by machine. Test Builder can't support that in its current design for four reasons. Um, that I'm going to gloss over. Mostly because we don't know when an assert ends. Um, uh, and then there's the problem of the output. Uh, Test Builder only outputs tap. Test Builder is written like uh, a CGI program circa 1998. You have all the, every function prints out a little bit of HTML, right? Uh, Test Builder is like that. Every function and every method in Test Builder prints out a little bit of tap. It's all just completely intertwined with everything. And that stinks because there are th other things than tap. There's, how many people here use Hudson or Jeeves or whatever it's renamed into? The any, in, integration testing thing, a little bit, not a whole lot. Um, Hudson really, really wants JUnit, uh, JUnit XML format. And there's a lot of testing tools that are already built around JUnit. Well, what if we could output JUnit instead? Um, what if we could output, you know, some new version of tap that we come up with? Uh, uh, that's really hard to do right now. Um, what if we wanted to output uh, as a GUI? What if we wanted to uh, dump it to a file? There's lots of uh, things that can be done now. Um, the final design problem is um, modules that want to change the state of the test. Like test no warnings wants to add a test silently at the end and that gets really, really hacky. Uh, they have to do things like, um, you know, put method wrappers around bits of test builder and, oh, it's ugly. So uh, wanting that to work better is a, is a major design goal. So how do we do this? Um, you, need, you need a way for third-party modules to hook into this. So, let's, so getting, finally, getting into test builder 2. Um, it's in a new namespace because it's incompatible with the old API. Um, that's okay. They'll still work together. Um, Years ago, the Pearl Foundation gave me a grant to, uh, to, to work on this. Uh, I think I said I would have it done in a few months. I think we're a little bit behind schedule. Um, but the problem was it's, it's, it was very, very start and stop. I would, I would hit a design problem, and I'd ruminate about it for months, and it just kept getting, it, it got out of control. It evolved way past what I originally envisioned when I started. Um, and it had this kind of like whirlpool design model where uh, it kept, you know, kept expanding and expanding and feeding back on itself. And every solution to a problem created, you know, illustrated that there were two more deeper problems that had to be worked on. And oh god, the thing was just never going to get done. So uh, uh, the solution to that was to scale way back. And um, so Test Builder 2 is now TB2 
because it's easier to write because there's a lot of Test Builder 2 classes. Um, and the internals worked out great. The internals of Test Builder 2 worked out fantastically. Uh, it's the new API for writing modules that was, that was never uh, having design issues. So I figured, well, um, what if we just take Test Builder, which has a known good API, and let's, um, let's take the Test Builder 2 internals and let's re-implement Test Builder on top of Test Builder 2. Uh, and then that would be a way to basically make sure it all, all the internals work without having to worry about all these complicated interface design, design problems. Um, and that thus, Test Builder 1.5 was born. And uh, that's what's currently being worked on in alpha releases. Um, uh, so test, where things stand is Test Builder 1.5 is feature complete, except for one small problem, CPEN. Uh, everything we care about on CPAN ultimately depends on Test Builder for its tests. Some, you know, you can, what, how many, what, what CPAN, like 22,000 uh, distributions at this point. Um, Test Builder 1.5 is a complete, well, an all, all but complete rewrite of Test Builder that has to pass the most punishing test suite ever created by man. It's been very enlightening. <laughs> it's, it's fixed a lot of bugs. It's, it's fixed a lot of design oversights where I was like, oh, we don't need this thing. Oh, God, we need that thing. Um, as much as possible, I focused on fixing test builder rather than patching the module because this, since this is effectively a test suite, it's not enough to say, well, this module will work. It's also you have to look at it as, well, if this module fails, there's probably a dozen dark pan you know, production code out there uh, dark pan tests that are going to fail in the same way or are going to abuse test, uh, test builder in the same way. Um, so this has been very, very useful and we're, we're kind of just sort of grinding through this and the current um, milestone of, uh, of alpha, well it's probably going to be alpha 7, is going to be to get all the major test modules working. Um, we just got test class working which was a big, big deal um, to, to like enable, this is a whole tree of CPAN modules you can't even test until test class works. Uh, the big problem is test TCP right now, um, which needs to share across forks. So anyhow, uh, I'd encourage you to try out your stack of modules with the latest alpha. Um, I I'll, I'll, should have a new alpha out before the end of the day. Um, and report any problems that you have, even if you think it's your fault. Because it's useful to know what people are having trouble with, and a lot of times it's not your fault. It's, it's, uh, but, or it's something that I have to like, oh, people are doing this, so I need to remember to add that to the thing. When does this end? Anybody know what, what the end time is? Oh, oh God. Okay, let's actually talk about how this thing works. Um, so the original uh, test builder flow was very simple. Uh, you have a test, um, it uses test modules, they all talk to test builder, and then test builder just does everything for you. Right? A wizard did it. You know, how does it work? A wizard did it. Test builder did it. Um, Test Builder 2 is, is much more flexible. Test Builder 2 is, um, or 1.5, it's an event-driven system. So rather than having Test Builder just do all the work, uh, builders generate events for everything that happens in a test. Um, so in here you have you know, uh, uh, the test script, and it's using two test modules, and these are using two different builders. And they both, when something happens, they generate an event, and that event gets handed to uh, a thing called the test state, and that uh, deals out that event to various event handlers. And one of them is um, storing the history, so it's recording statistics about the state of the test. The other one are the formatters that are producing the output. And then there is whatever other handler you might want to add. And this makes things very, very flexible. It also means that I can't cheat. Uh, I can't make test builder cheat and, uh, and you know, get in bed with uh, uh, the rest of the system. I'm on the same level as anybody else that wants to write a builder now. All the information that the tap, say the tap formatter needs must come as an event. Um, uh, so, uh, there we go. So a builder is now really nothing more than a convenience wrapper for generating these events. Um, for example, here's an example of writing an OK method if you wanted to write your own builder. Uh, it gets, you know, uh, in this case, I'm calling it as a method. 
it gets the test to check and its name, and it generates a result event um, up there, tells it the name, tells it whether or not it passed, and then it just basically looks and says, all right, where was I called from? All right, I'm going to tell the result. The result came from this file, from this line, and post the event to the test state and return it. Done. Very, very, very easy. You don't have to worry about anything else except getting that event done. So what this creates is a, a federation of, 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 of builders written by different people all using the same event system. Uh, and that removes me as the bottleneck for, for getting uh, interesting things done. This is very different than where I started <laughs> when I decided to, uh, to rebuild this, but it, it, you know, things uh, go in interesting ways. So, uh, so basically what it comes down to is we don't like how Test Builder works. You can just write your own. Um, please. Uh, and you don't have to support all the features and all the code that's uh, dependent upon Test Builder, so it's way easier than the job that I have uh, maintaining it. Uh, so moving on, let's talk about the event system. I guess that's a, an event. <laughs> so like I said, everything that happens in a test generates an event or it didn't happen. Um, so for example, here's a simple test. It sets a plan, it runs a test, it, it um, puts out a note, uh, you know, a comment about it, and this, act, this generates uh, events. So um, the plan would say, well, I'm, I haven't started a test yet, so I'm going to issue a test start event, and then I'm going to issue a, uh, a set plan event to indicate that they set the plan. Uh, and then this result, uh, this, this is, will issue a result event, and then because it needs those uh, commenty diagnostics, it'll print that out, it'll send that as a log event. And then finally, this note is also a log, and then when the program exits, it'll issue a test end event. So everything is in these, in these events. These events are all objects, and you can you know, ask them the stuff that are in it, you know, how many, hey plan, how many asserts were, did you have, did result, did you pass, log, what's your message, what's your severity level, kind of like uh, syslog. And internally, when a builder posts an event, it goes to first the test state object, which then hands it off to its event coordinator. I'm going to gloss over why. That's for subtests. Um, and then that, the, each event goes to a list of event handlers. Is that the light of the train coming? To <laughs> <laughs> um, so, um, and then the handlers, the list of handlers actually have some sort of ordering to them. You can have, uh, there's a list of early handlers, which can, uh, are typically for things that want to modify events. You can actually uh, modify an event in an early handler. For example, test no warnings. Uh, we'll see later if, it, if it, uh, uh, it wants to add a test. So if it sees a, a set plan go by, it takes it and it adds one, and then it lets it you know, move on its way. Um, then we have a history object. That, uh, that's the second thing that gets the event, and that stores statistics about the state of the test so that you don't have to, so that none of these handlers have to keep state. They can just ask the history object. Um, very important. Uh, then you have a list of formatters, and note it's a list of formatters. So this could be the tap formatter, but it could, it could be like a tap formatter that prints to standard out, and then maybe you want to take like an XML dump and put it into a file. You can do that. You can have two formatters in there if you want. And finally, you have late handlers that can do whatever they want when all the other processing is done. And that makes everything uh, fairly flexible, although I've, I've, I've never done an event system before. So anybody that has any advice that they have, I would love to hear it, because I'm probably doing something really naive. Um, uh, right. So the event handlers uh, basically see everything that happens in this, in this, in this ecosystem. Uh, so for example, um, you could have a, the test state object will be getting events from, say, test builder 2, and then it's dealing it out to you know, maybe test no warnings, inserts a handler, and there's the history object, and there's the formatter, and then, you know, ceiling count is watching you write run tests. Um, everything, everything gets, everything is on the same level. So, for example, I'm going to go through how you would write, or how we have written test no warnings in Test Builder 2. Uh, you can already find it in the source repository there. Um, so you would start by writing a handler for uh, the test start event. And all that really does is it says, all right, we're starting a test, so I'm going to add my warning handler to trap all the warnings that happen. Simple. And now that's polite, because it doesn't, it doesn't actually trap warnings until you actually start running tests. That would be very polite of it. 
Um, and then when it sees a plan go by, it, uh, it get, takes the event, it sees if it has, um, it adds one to the number of asserts that it, ex that it expects, and then that's it. So it just modifies that event, and that means it's going to be an early handler. And then finally, at the end of the test, when it sees a test end event, um, it checks to see if it's seen any warnings, and it generates a, uh, uh, a test off of that. And I, I could have done that by actually generating the result, but I didn't. Uh, and then it politely removes its warning handler. <laughs> Isn't that nice? Uh, which it can do, it can do now, it couldn't do before. And then finally, you, um, you take your handler and you add it to the test state as an early handler. And now it's registered, and now it's going to be watching events. So that's what use, use test no warnings would actually do inside its import method. Any questions about that? So is it your, plan, your plan is not to include uh, test no warnings in the core module, is it? Mm -mm. Nope. No, no, no. I'll just... Uh, have that be rewritten, and just, just as an example. Yeah. yeah. Uh, don't you have conflicts uh, in orders of who gets registered in the early handlers and stuff like that? Yeah. Say again? Uh, could you have uh, ordering conflicts in uh, the way modules get uh, registered in uh, early handlers or late handlers? Do, uh, oh, ordering, ordering of the handlers? Yes. Explicitly not. The only ordering you can rely on is that early handlers are called before history, are called before formatters, are called before late handlers. But amongst the late handlers and amongst the early handlers and amongst the formatters, there's no ordering uh, there because what you really because you can't because if if you load uh, test no warnings and it inserts a, 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 an early handler and you load another module that also inser, inserts an early handler, they can't coordinate with each other and they've got they must run on the assumption that somebody else will inject a handler. Nobody gets to be first, or nobody gets to guarantee to be first. Yeah? So originally it was envisioned that we should be able to handle infinite streams. Yes. So what's going on here? Oh, uh, we'll get to that. We'll get to that. I have a question. Yeah. Um, so can you go back to the uh, Yes. So here you have uh, your point out the bubble, and you're calling OK. Uh-huh. Does that mean that the test result and the diagnostics of all the tests are unrelated? Um, we'll get to that. Okay. <laughs> that's, a, that's a design problem. That's an open design problem. Um, so another example, uh, debug on fail. Uh, so when a test and assert fails, you, you get thrown into the debugger. This one's really easy. You write uh, your event handler. Um, uh, event handling is a role. And you just simply say, um, if, if the result was true, return. Otherwise. If you're already in the debug, if, if, if you have to have the debugger running, there's probably ways to make this uh, fire up a debugger, but I'll leave it to somebody else. When you have the debugger running, it just, boop, stops and dumps you right here. Which is a little coarse, but it's there for demonstration purposes. If there are people that know debugger magic that could make you, that can make the debugger dump you out a specific file in line, that would be amazing. But I think that's pretty cool. Uh, it's not die on fail, but it's, you, we can start to do things like that. Um, so right, so you have debug on fail, and you would uh, write your code like that, and then you have something fails, and you get dumped into the debugger, and you can look at the result, and you can return up the stack, and you can do whatever you want there, instead of having to like insert db single all over the place in your test if you use the debugger. How many people here use the debugger? Okay, yeah. Well, was there a question? Sorry. What are the requirements of the queue? What are the It will be nothing. It will be same same as before. No prerequisites. We'll, we're, we're solving it. It'll, it'll use a, um, uh, right now it uses mouse, it ships a version of mouse with it, um, but it's going to uh, switch to a compiled, a yet to be created compiled OO, a compiled OO system. But worse comes to worse, it just ships with a copy of mouse, um, and, uh, and that's that. It's a little slow with, uh, on the startup, it's a problem with it. Um, Ten minutes left. Ten minutes left, oh boy, okay. Mm. So here's an example of a formatter, uh, a simple HTML formatter. Um, when the test starts, it outputs the HTML uh, uh, header stuff. When it sees a result, it uh, turns that result into a, um, a line in that table, and you see how bad I am at HTML because I'm using tables. Um, and then uh, I thought I fixed that. 
Oh, I fixed it in the code. The example, the actual code is better. Uh, and then when you, uh, when you see a test end event, you close all your HTML. And you produce, uh, and then when you want to run it, you can set it as an environment variable and say, hey, use this formatted class instead of the default one. Um, and you get something horrible like that. <laughs> Which, like I said, really just goes to say, I don't know how to write HTML. But uh, it's a proof of concept, and I you know, want somebody else to work on these things because they're low-hanging fruit. Um, I write enough to exercise the system, make sure it all works, and then somebody else can come along and, and, uh, who's really into it and finish it all off because it's, it's relatively easy to do. Um, other ideas, uh, I was talking about the JUnit formatter, and if you were to write it yourself, you put it in TBI, uh, TB2X, uh, a JUnit formatter for Hudson and, and interoperability with the whole, the testing universe outside of Perl. Um, you could have a JSON that basically just outputs all the test events as JSON, both for debugging purposes, but you could also have a, uh, a harness a test harness that instead of parsing tap, and tap is like a soda straw, it's really lossy, it doesn't really contain a whole lot of information that uh, we have inside the test. Test outputs all the events as JSON, harness just pulls them all in and deserializes, so you don't need a tap parser, and then it has all the same information as the test itself does. That'll be pretty interesting. Um, you could maybe you know, send test events to some IDE that runs, I don't know, uh, also think possible. You can make a simple GUI uh, version that you know has a nice little green bar like people like. Um, you could have one that bails out uh, when a test uh, fails. So instead of die on fail, that, that stops when a, an assert fails, this stops when, a, uh, when, it, when it gets to a test end event and it says, oh, this test failed, so I'm going to tell test harness bail out. Um, don't run the rest of the test suite. And that would save people a lot of time. Um, so I don't have a lot of time. I don't have a lot of time left. Uh, let's see. Uh, there's the history object uh, that keeps statistics. Um, you can ask things like, uh, "Can we still succeed?" Which is kind of a weird way for reasons of saying of saying, "Have we have we already failed? Uh, can we succeed? Like, have we run too many tests? Did we fail something? Did something coming out of order?" Um, you can ask it, "Hey, was the test successful?" You don't have to do all the logic around that. Um, you can ask it, "Hey, what was the plan? Give me the give me the plan event uh, so I can look at it." And then you have all of these things to give you statistics about the tests that have happened. And the important thing there is that we no longer store uh, the test events. So we no longer store all the results. That means that we're now using order one memory. No matter how many tests you run, you're always going to be using whatever, the, the same amount of memory. Um, previously, you know, running uh, 100,000 tests would cost you 50 megs and it would grow. I think it was something like... Um, 500 bytes per test. Uh, is that what you're asking about, Curtis? That's related, yeah. Okay. Um, that's great. That's, you know, like a freebie. It, it might break a hand, little bit of code. Um, let's see, almost out of time. So, uh, the future. Um, it's, Test Builder 2 is big. <laughs> it's got a lot, it's very well factored, uh, let's put it that way. So, like I said, the design phase has ended and the scope has stopped expanding and all the major pieces are working and, and um, uh, uh, really what it comes down to is that we're just, it's the fight, it's a slog against CPAN at this point. Um, uh, fix things, run, run it against CPAN, see what fails, fix, this, fix stuff for it, smoke CPAN again. Uh, and hopefully more things pass than, uh, than fail. Um, more things that we want to have, I was talking about all the different formatters I'd like to see. I'd really like to see somebody else write a new builder um, at this point. Uh, and uh, there's lots of there's other, other open problems. But whenever I talk about this, people want to know, all right, what about test more two? Because um, you know, there's some user visible things in here, but really test more is what everybody uses. So um, I have this idea that I've stolen from, from NUnit, uh, and that is not the right slide. That's the right slide. Um, so right now, tests, you write tests as tests. But what tests really are, are, are really clever comparison functions that also happen to output test data. And a lot of people really want those comparison functions for, uh, for production code. Like uh, test deep is, a, is an amazing uh, 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 large data structure comparison system. And it does some wacky things to let you use it in production code. 
What NUnit does, which is the .NET, what's a.NET um, uh, testing system, is it says, all right, write, just write a comparison function, but have it return a comparison object. And this object is, is Boolean overloaded, so it knows whether the comparison you know, uh, uh, succeeded or failed. But this object also contains all the information about that comparison that you might want to know. So if it's comparing two strings, it might tell you the diff, or it might tell you what the two strings were, or it might, uh, you know, any of them other things. If it's, if it's, if it's uh, um, uh, comparing, well, I don't know what else we'll compare. Um, five minutes left? Five minutes left? Yeah. Okay. Um, and then, so it returns this comparison object, and the way that you turn that into a test, a test is now nothing more than a thing that accepts comparison objects. And if the comparison succeeded, the test succeeds. If the comparison fails, the test fails. Uh, and now you have that nice separation between the production comparison code and the testing code. Very interesting. I'd love to see somebody explore that. Uh, right, so um, uh, we have the, this diagnostic problem that I mentioned before. Um, the, what we really want to see is this. Um, that is an open problem mostly because this is fine for like is, but we really, want to, we really want you to be able to put your own metadata in here. We really want you to be able to say, uh, Salva was asking me about, telling me about the system that uh, feeds tests into Nagios, which is really interesting. And so really what he wants to say is like, all right, I tested something and this has a really high severity if it fails. So I want to pass this in as, as metadata and then uh, the Nagios server can get that data out um, of the YAML or the JSON or whatever it is we wind up actually using. And you can do interesting things with that, like, you know, I have a list of hosts. Um, hey, check to make sure that they all work. And then, but I'm going to let you know in the metadata that, um, that I was testing this host and this port, and you might even tell, like, what, what you were doing. And that would come out like that. And then a Nagios could warn you when, uh, when this one fails, that it can say, okay, this host web server is down. And it would know that in the, in the metadata. Any... So, uh, Sartak, were you asking about? Yeah. So, how do you relate the diagnostics to the events, the, the test result events? Yes, that this is one API we're working on. Um, so, the first thing you do is is uh, is would just do it internally. Um, it would generate a result event, and then it would add all the information to the result event, and then it would post it. So now we can separate, since we have a separation between creating the result and posting the result, uh, having it go to the handlers. So that's easy enough for internal stuff like, you know, is and like and anything else. Um, and that's the, we're not sure. Uh, that's, this is an open design problem. If the, uh, this, this, this idea is to hijack the, the name field uh, so that everybody doesn't have to change their APIs. You can just pass a hash ref and as a name and it goes, oh, this is, this is actually metadata. It's not, it's not your name. Uh, and that might uh, be one way to do it. And that would be one way that it could get all the way down into Test Builder um, without having to change everybody's APIs. Um, the other idea, there's a whole um, pull, there's, a, there's an issue on GitHub, I think it's 311, um, where we're talking about this. And uh, the other idea is to, uh, I don't have a lot of time. Look at the, look at the pull request, I'll show it to you later. Uh, let's see, what else do we have? So there's a design document, it's hideously out of date, please don't read it. <laughs> um, so what, what, what can you do? Um, I use GitHub, uh, we use pull requests really heavily. I try to, when I post issues, I try to, when possible, um, identify the ones that are easy, and I put it in the easy label. So you can, if you want to try and uh, work on something, you can go to the issues list, click easy, and pick something up. Of course, it's what I think is easy which isn't always, uh, doesn't always work out. Um, you can run it, load a smoker up with the latest alpha and run it. I'm going to put out a new alpha today um, and report the differences. So you have to smoke like the alpha against the latest stable and report the differences. The differences are what's really interesting. Um, you can write a formatter. Um, you can take an existing formatter and make it better. Um, you can uh, test it against your module and let me know and uh, I don't have time to get into, get into that. Um, you don't actually have to rewrite your test with test tester. It would just be very good for the future. Two minutes left. Two minutes left. OK, uh, that's, that's all my content. Um, so uh, thank you to all these people who have helped out with the design uh, over the years. Um, and uh, yeah.
thanks. So, any questions? No? Any, 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 uh, anybody have any weird ideas that they might want to do with this? Anybody have anything really frustrating that they can't do with tests right now? Anybody think it's too hot in this room? <laughs> yes. I think it's too hot in this room. Hmm. Yes. With YAML, I think many people agree that YAML is a bit of a, a frustration. Mm -hmm. I don't know, I haven't updated my brain. Uh, honestly, they're a bit more compressed. I can fit them on a slide. <laughs> um, yeah, I just haven't updated my brain. The nice part about it is that if I, if I sit down and I write, you know, the formatter is YAML, somebody else can just come along and put in a, a, a JSON addition as well and add a switch and we can argue about which one is the default. But it's, um, it's all very, very encapsulated. Oh, we, we, we can argue about which one, which one is going to be standard. Yes. Yeah. And I'm, I'm, I, I don't care. That's good, because I'm right. So. <laughs> <laughs> you, were, you were probably right five years ago in Oslo. <laughs> Anybody else? All right, thank you.